Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alamin. Ar-Rahmanirrahim. Maliki Yawmuddin. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I declare that there is none worthy of worship other than Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the final messenger of Allah. Today we are going to look at a topic called the Bible and the Quran or scientific and historical analysis of the Bible and the Quran. And this is such an important question because many times when missionaries or clergymen come to your house and they want to tell you about the Bible, many Muslims don't know exactly how to answer them. And to tell you the truth, many Christians do not know the origins of Scripture themselves. So inshallah, during this uh, few episodes that are coming up, we will have a look at the scientific and the historical analysis of both the Quran and the Bible. And this way it will empower you, inshallah, that you will be able to answer people when they ask you about your faith. When they ask you, what makes the Quran so special? What makes the Quran better than the Bible? How, where did the Bible come from? Who created the Bible? Who were the originators of the Holy Quran? Was it written by man or was it inspired and delivered to by Allah himself? So we're going to look at these questions and see what impact it has on the 21st century. A great scholar or modern scholar of our times, he made a statement, he says, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. So today we are going to be part of a revolutionary act. Very similar to other modern 21st century men or 20th century men like Martin Luther, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi. All these people stood firm and, and they, they asked questions that were requiring and tough of the times. They were revolutionary people who stood up for what was right be it for the anti-racism campaigns, whether it was freeing of their countries, or if it was for the cause of humanity. These people stood as, as icons of our century. And so today we need to ask, like Martin Luther stated many years back, is the cowardice asks the question, is it safe? The expedient asks the question, is it political? The vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? You see, there comes a time that one must he is in, and he must decide whether it is not safe, not political, and not popular, but it is done because it is right. So we have to look at ourselves and ask ourselves a question when we study any sacred text. Is it safe? Is it political? Or is it popular? But sometimes we've got to ignore these things and have a look and say, is it true? Is this really right? Is this the book that we can rely on? And so we are going to have a look briefly at church history. And looking at church history in this segment, we're going to look at who was the savior of the church. You see, many times missionaries and evangelists and Christians will come to your door or see you on the street and they will tell you that you need to be liberated, you need to be free. As Muslims, you don't really have salvation. You don't have assurance that one day when you die, you will, you'll be saved from this, this world and torment that we are going to go into the hereafter. The ticket is that you need to be saved. You need salvation. So let's look at who the saviors of the church were. Was it as the Christians claimed Jesus Christ, uh, Prophet Isa, peace be upon him? Or could it be somebody else or was it somebody else? So let's look at church history. One of the characters that comes out in church history is the man Constantine. Now Constantine was a man who was around in, the, in about 300 AC, uh, thereabouts. And uh, he was a very um, determined man. He was a political person who wanted power. And he was not on the line to basically succeed any of the... Uh, Romans at the time and so he had to fight his way to the top of the food, food chain and so this man had he was very politically motivated and he wanted to to be the the next Caesar if you would like and so this man wanted to find a way to unify people now the Romans had tried to go forth and conquer most of the countries that they'd been into and most of the lands that they had taken 
but they never really tried to unify people under one, one um, spirituality or one political system before. And Constantine came along with a universal idea of unifying all people together. Today we have something similar to that if we look at the United Nations and look at NATO. The idea of the United Nations and NATO is to bring everybody together. Let's have a common round table where people can meet around and discuss things and come to a common agenda, common goals, common plans for the future. Now recently we have all seen the financial collapse that has taken place in the world, how the dollar and the rupee and the rand and the yen have all been attacked by what has happened in the, in the uh, financial systems. And what happens, people got together and they sat around a table and decided, how do we save our economy? Same thing happens when in war-torn areas where there are problems. NATO will sit together and they will decide, what is the way forward? Now, during this time, Constantine had the same idea. So, basically, he decided to pull together a group of people. The first people that he got together were people that were going to help him in his fight, physical war. And so he built up a very strong army, a very strong alliances with people from all different walks of life. He had people in his alliance that were pagans, people that were in the alliance that were, were Christians. He had people in his alliance that were Jews. He had people in his alliance that believed in nothing at all. So what he wanted to do is get people in this alliance, politically as well as uh, militarily, that would work together for a common good. And also, he also got together people that were like-minded, that had a vision for the future, if you would like. And so he needed to unite the people together. So immediately when he got, got these people together, he started to have a very important dreams. Now, one of the things that you do, if you go to a doctor and you say you have a back pain, it's very, very difficult for the doctor to say whether you had that back pain or not. Because it doesn't really show up in x-rays. You can't really prove that the person has a back pain or not. And many people, when they wanted to get out of work or sport, or if you're in the military, you want to get out of doing military service, you claim that you have constant back pains. And so in the same way, this man, Constantine, claimed that he had dreams. And now you can't prove somebody if their dreams are, are true or not. So everyone had to accept these dreams. And in one of the dreams he had, he had a prophetic dream. And he had a dream, this was around 312 AD. He had a dream that he must go into battle in the sun. And in this dream, he claimed that he saw a sun that he must put onto the flags. Whenever they go into a battle, the sun they must put on, onto their flags. And they must conquer in the sun. They must go into battle in the sun. Now, Christians have often claimed that the sun was the cross. And the cross was put onto the flags, and they would go into battle with, this, with, cross, with, the, with the cross on the flag. And you see in many of the pictures of the early crusaders, you saw they had a flag with a big cross on it, and they went into battle. But this is impossible because it was only 300 years later that the Christians ever used the sign of the cross. So the only possibility that he could possibly have had, the only sign that he could possibly have had on the cross, were two things. The early Christians used the fish as a symbol of uni unity of all the Christian um, people together. Or it would have been the sun, which is a round disk with rays of sun going off it, the, the S-U-N sun, not the S-O-N sun. And so it is not possible, as the Christians have claimed, that, that uh, Constantine used the cross when he went into battle because this was, the symbol wasn't even used for another 300 years. It was only in, the, in, in around 600 AC that the cross was used for the very first time. So it had to be either the fish or the sun. So now, thinking about that, let's have a look further and find out what this man did. Constantine had went into battles and went into war, and he had many victories, and he triumphed over his enemies because he brought all these people together. He brought the Christians together, he brought the pagans together. And so what he did, bringing these people together, he needed to have a religion that unified all these different faiths together. He didn't like the idea that the Christians had their own idea, and the Jews had their own idea, and that the uh, pagans had their own idea. He wanted to unify them all under one body. And so what he did, he decided to, to convey a council. In other words, uh, like you get the picture of the, of the United Nations, they all come together for a, a few days. He did the same thing, and he had a concave. Now, anyone who knows anything about Catholicism, they know that during, during the time when they elect a new pope, they all get locked into a room. And they must decide on what, who is going to be the new pope, or what the new pope should be, or what his job should be, or what his duty should be. And they're not allowed out that room until they have come to a decision. So you could say that this was the first concave that was ever held. And this was held in AD 325. So all these spiritual people were put together. And these were not only Christians that were brought together in this group. It was people representing all different faiths. And they were put together in this room and they had to decide on basic fundamentals of religion. 
Later, there was another group brought together, also in the Council of Nicaea, and they were also brought together. But this time, they were brought together to decide what the doctrines of the church should be. In other words, what do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe about Jesus, the son of Mary? What do we believe about God? What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? What do we believe about baptism? And so all these doctrines were going to be discussed by the Council of Nicaea. So what happened is when the Council of Nicaea got together, they decided on many of these doctrines that would be inside the Bible, or be doctrines of the church, not doctrines of the Bible, but doctrines of the church, by voting. So they would, say, they would sit together and say, all those in favor, raise your hands, and they would raise their hands. So this is how they decided on what doctrines the church would accept or not. Remember, they weren't deciding what doctrines would be in the Bible. They were deciding on what doctrines would be in the church. And today we have a look at the church and we often find that the doctrines that the church has and the doctrines of the Bible oppose each other. For example, Trinity. The idea of the Trinity is something that we do not find anywhere in the Bible, not in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, yet it is a doctrine of the church. When people ask the church, why do you believe in the Trinity? They say, this is a doctrine of the church. This we believe by faith. It is an article of faith. It's not an article from the Bible. It's an article decided upon by the Council of Nicaea by vote. People raised their hand and said, all those in favor of having a, having a triune God, raise your hands. And those in favor raised their hands. Now, why did they vote on the Trinity? What was the reason that people would raise their hands and say, this is a really good idea. Let's decide to have three gods. Well, you must understand the nature of the people at that time. These people elected many different gods to be their gods in their area. They decided what gods they would have in their area. So they chose almost by vote those people before Christianity came along, what their god should have or where he should be from or what his abilities or powers should be. So you see that the, the, the people there had a very different idea of what religion um, was and what, what their god should be. So when it came to Christianity, was they used the same concepts or the same principles that they had used in their pagan gods. Now the predominant god of Constantine, or the god that he followed, wasn't Christianity, as many have, have stated or said before. He actually believed in the cult of the Solo Invincis, or the Invincis, Invincible Son. So when we come back from the break, we're going to have a look at what is the belief that Constantine tried to push into the modern church of today. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We continue uh, the topic of the Bible and the Quran and discover, discovering the historical and scientific evidence within both of these documents. Now we've been looking at the origins of the Bible and now we're going to look at the origins of Christianity. We said that Constantine was a man who brought together a group of different people from different faiths trying to un unite them under one religion or one belief because he didn't want a divided kingdom. He brought his military together, he brought his politics together, and all he needed to do now was bring the religions together. Now, he himself was not a Christian. As many, as many people try to say that he was a Christian, as many people there try to convince us that he was born again Christian, one of the first born again Christians, there's no evidence for this. We only speculate. Remember he had a dream and he said, in this sign you will conquer, and the Christians claim that this sign had to be the cross. But we, as we are told you earlier, it was only 600 AC that we found the cross being used as the symbol that the Christians used. Before that, it was the fish, or it was the sun, the S-U-N sun, not the S-O-N sun. Well, not at that point. Up to this point, the S-O-N was not considered, the sun was not considered part of God. The Trinity was a concept that was voted upon at the Council of Nicaea. And so everyone raised their hands and said, oh, those in favor, and those who were opposed, and that's how the decision was made. So let's carry on and we have a look at the origins of Christianity. Now we're going to look at this into three separate sections. The first section is the pagan god of sun worship. Now the Christians had to find a S-U-N and an S-O-N to overlap over each other. So what they needed to do is they had to get the people to be convinced in their mind that if they look at the sun up in the sky and the, the sun who came down on earth and then the idea of the sun was, had to be the prophet Isa peace be upon him, they had to make Jesus Christ the sun that had come down to earth and give a new life and renew re regeneration to the earth. So what they needed to do is they needed to overlap these two concepts in the minds of the Christian. If you had have gone to the Christian during the time of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, those who have followed the teachings of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him at that time, and you had to say, this man that you're walking with, he is the son of God. They would have laughed at him. They would have probably stoned the person and thought, how absurd. Paul, the, one of the writers of, of the New Testament, who many people attest and many people claim 
uh, backs up the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, he himself said that this is impossible. And we will do this in further studies as we go further into studying the Bible and the Quran. We'll, I'll show you verses where Paul says that it is impossible for Jesus to be the Son of God. So we, as we go through it, we'll have a look at where, the, where these teachings came from, where these pagan ideas came from that Jesus could possibly have been the Son of God, that the prophet Isa was actually God, which we know that is impossible. The prophet Isa, peace be upon him, was a faithful servant and a loyal messenger of Allah. Nothing more and nothing less. So the pagan sun worship at that time, there were two major religions of the time. Obviously, there were many, many religions, depending on the customs and, and the areas and the geographic location of people. But where Constantine was, there were two main religions. And that was Mithraism, believing in Mithra, the god Mithra, or, or the, the, hum, the deity Mithra, and the cult of the sun worship, or the divine sun, or the cult of Solar Invictus. And so during this time, those, there were major festivals that people had for these two religions, those who followed the sun and those who followed Mithraism. And it was the sun, S-U-N again, not the S-O-N. You see, Constantine's uh, religion of the time was to follow basically a combination of Mithraism and those who worshipped the sun, or the cult of Solo Invictus. And so what happened, these, both these religions had major festivals through the years. And so Constantine wanted to make sure that these festivals that he was used to be, being part of, these festivals that he was involved with, he wanted to bring these into Christianity. So he wanted them to correlate with each other. So Christmas needed to fall into the same time as celebrations of Mithraism and sun worship. And so when you ask Christians today, you say, why is it that you choose Sunday? They have no real answer. Now, I must admit that there are some religions and some Christian religions that do not worship on a Sunday because they understand that Sunday is, worship, is the worship of the sun, and they want no way to be involved with that. Now, our Seventh-day Adventist friends, they can show you through the Bible many places where the, the Sabbath was to be kept. And so they know that Christians are keeping the wrong day, that Sunday is not the day of worship. This was a day of worship that the Constantine had brought into the church to purposely deceive people, to purposely get people to worship on the wrong day. Now, many people must say, might say that keep every day. Every day is a day of worship. If Allah has ordained a certain day for you to worship and a, a certain day for you to pray and you change it, you are going against uh, the commands of Allah. If Allah says that you must do wudu, you must do wudu. You can't say, well, I, don't, I choose not to do it. If Allah says that you must pray five times a day and you don't, you cannot choose whether to do it or not. And this is the command given by Allah. It's like me saying to you, you can choose to breathe or not. If you decide not to breathe, what do you think will happen? You will go red in the face and then you'll eventually pass out and possibly die. And if someone revives you, you may have damage to your brain. So these are things that we have to do. So when people go against Allah's will, when they go against the commands of, of God, what are they actually doing? They are moving into error and they are beginning to worship in error and they're beginning to do things in error. So Christians who worship on a Sunday, there is no Jew on the planet, no Muslim on the planet and no Seventh-day Adventist on the planet who believes that Sunday is the day that they should go to church or worship. This is specifically done to corrupt the, the teachings of, of, of the prophets before. Constantine's religion was to bring in cult worship, to bring in the occult, to bring in the forbidden into...